Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for each person that's listening this morning. And we just pray, Lord, that we would cast all of our cares upon you. Lord, let us lay down all of our troubles and our worries this morning. Turn to you, the one true God who has the answers to our problems in life. And we pray now that you'd use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us, to encourage us. We pray that, Lord, as that breeze comes in off the ocean, Lord, that you really would refresh us with the blowing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to have eyes to see you this morning and to touch us and help us to walk with newness of life in this coming week, walking close to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, guys, would you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 as we're going to continue our study in depth through this beautiful passage. We've been introduced to the, the very first two, well, not even verses, the two lines of the first verse. Paul The first verse says he is a bond slave of Christ. That's his introduction. And this is what we're doing. We're breaking down the book to see who's writing the book. And today we get to the part, who is he writing to? Remember I said if you know who's writing and who they're writing to, and, you know, like the main, today we actually get to hear hear the main reason why he's writing. I don't know about you, but whenever someone calls me, you know, on the phone, hi, this is so-and-so from this place. I, I just want to, I'm a kind of get to the point person, like, what do you want? And I want to know what they want. I want to know what's their point. Are they making a sales call? Are they doing a survey? Whatever it is that I know how fast to hang up. <laughs> but if they're, it, you know, does anyone else f- share the sentiment with me that you just, you need to, like, I love that the Bible is clear. It tells us who's writing these books, who they're writing to, and why. You know, in a lot of literature today, the why is missing. And the kids are confused. They read this stuff and they're like, I don't really get the point. And it's because the author didn't make a point. <laughs> they're like, some of the worst writers I've ever read are some of the ones of, la- of late, the, the recent ones, that just forgot simple things like somebody should have stuck them in my english class that i had to take when i was younger where we had to learn to write with purpose to write you know clearly with a point make the point and 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 make the sub points and let them know this is what we're going to cover see i love the book of romans because paul is a very methodical guy he was schooled under a man named gamaliel he was one of the highest sought after Hebrew teachers of the day. And he didn't just do okay in his Hebrew school. He reached what we would call, what would be a doctorate degree? Pharisee of Pharisees. To get the title Pharisee of Pharisees meant you, yeah, first of all, you had to take the whole book of Isaiah. It's a scroll in Hebrew. And you had to write it out by hand, every jot, every tittle, every little vowel inflection mark, every little comma, every, every punctuation mark, all by hand, and you had to memorize it. Now, he did that. He had the book of Isaiah. Down. In fact, it's really obvious that Paul had a really great command of the Old Testament, what, what we, they call the Hebrews call their scriptures. He had them down. And, and I appreciate that because when he goes to teach, he uses a lot of Hebrew style teaching, which is a teaching style that first will usually introduce an idea in a broad sense, and then it will, you know, main point, like, okay, here's the main point, and then let's take the main point and break it down into what? Here's the three sub points of the main point, you know, and this leads to, therefore, to the next point. Very, like, systematic, easy to follow. For me, I like that style of teaching. I don't know about you, but it's got purpose, and I know where he's going. Well, today, we've already gone over that he said he found the best master, and he is now a bondservant. By choice, he's a slave of Christ. And last week, we went over his calling. He said he was called as an apostle, one that means a sent one, what Christ sent him. Now, today, we get to find out where is he sent to. 
This is important. When you call an apostle, if you're a sent one, you have to be sent somewhere. If you're not sent somewhere, you're not really an apostle. Okay, I mean, sorry. By definition of the word, you have to be sent by Christ to go to somebody. You have to go to reach the one he sent you to, or else you're not really an apostle. So let's look at, his, at what he says today as he is an apostle that is going to be sent. And, and before we get to the part what, what, who he's sent to, he's going to say the purpose for what he was sent. This is a really good one for me, my favorite. You know, I like to know the purpose. It's just sweet to my spirit to know this guy had a purpose. He says he was set apart. Look at verse 1, the last part of the verse. He was set apart for the gospel of God. Gospel means good news. For the good news of God, Paul says, I was set apart. God just said, I'm taking you, choosing you, and setting you apart. I've got a special role for you to fulfill. And it's going to be for my good news. The good news of God. Now, what is God's good news? Don't worry, he spells it out. This is probably one of the best. If you have a friend who doesn't know about the gospel, and you want to... Um, Give them the Reader's Digest. Like, okay, you know, like maybe they're just new to it and you just want to compress it into really short, succinct bullet points. You know, spark notes, that's what the kids call it. On the, on the, uh, on the uh, internet now, they just look up. They don't read the articles anymore. They just read the spark notes. What's the main points? Well, here's the spark notes of the entire, this is from a, a guy who studied all the scripture, knows the whole story, and he's going to break it down into a couple one paragraph that sums up the whole thing. I mean, you're talking about a great summing up. This, and he knew his stuff. Look what he says. He says, I was set apart for the gospel which God promised beforehand through the holy prophets. And, and I, I'm sorry, through his prophets and the holy scriptures. Concerning, it says, his son, who was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh, and who was declared the son of God with power by a certain thing, this is where it really sums up, what is it that made him declared the son of God? He was a son of David according to the flesh. That's why in the book of Matthew we have the genealogy of Jesus to Abraham, born Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, all the way down through David, all the way down till we get to Jesus, the birth of Jesus. As he enters this earth, he fulfilled all those prophecies about how the Messiah would come to a certain lineage. That was a giveaway for the Jews. By the way, in case they wanted to know, how do you know which guy is the right guy? He's got to be born through this certain lineage. He has to be born in a certain place, Bethlehem, the house of bread. He has to be called out of Egypt. He has to fill all these scriptures. That's why the book of Matthew spends so much time saying Jesus did this according to the scripture. And Jesus did that according to So that the scripture might be, what's the word? Fulfilled. See, Jesus came to fulfill what God had promised. And Paul says, here's the gospel, the good news. God, who promised beforehand that he would send someone to save us, guess what he did? Fulfilled his promise. I mean, that's boiling it down, but isn't that true? He fulfilled his promise, and he proved that this Jesus was not just the son of David according to the flesh, but that he was the son of God according to some greater thing that he did. And this is the hallmark, the very keystone of our Christian faith is found in the very next line. What, did, what, did, what proved him to be the power of the what? The resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, it says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He was the one who through whom he says, we received grace and we received apostleship to being about the obedience of of faith amongst the Gentiles for his name's sake. I was sent by God to bring about obedience of faith, to let people know, follow the Lord. To the, to the who? The Jews? No. Gentile, by the way, means anyone non-Jewish. is a Gentile. Paul had a, a very specific apostleship. One that in the Jewish faith, if you were to tell another Jew, I'm going to go bring good news of God's salvation to those non-Jews. How, how popular was he back home, by the way? They went, get lost, buddy. You know, you, you, th those are, by the way, the Jews had a name for us. 
that are anyone not Jewish, raise your hand and just see. Okay, we're, we're Gentiles. We're called Gentile dogs by the Jews. That's what they call non-Jewish -Jew people. They just, it's not polite. Okay, don't think they're being nice. Like, oh, puppy, hey, you know, I love my doggy. No, they're using it in the baddest connotation. You know, dog poops on the carpet, you know, ruins the thing. You Gentile dog. You're they, not in a good way. That's how the Jews viewed the non-Jews. And Paul says, but God called me, sent me to the people who need the gospel. And he promised that the gospel would go to all man. Not just to... Now, Paul will say in this, the same book, right here in the book of Romans, later on in this discourse, he'll say, salvation went first to the Jew, but then to who? The Gentile. He's going to be the one that explains fully how that works. And he's got a great insight into the whole spiel of how the Jewish-Gentile relationship is something God's at work in. He's doing a cool thing. But we're not to that part yet. We're just to the sum up of the gospel. The sum up is that God sent Jesus and, and he declared him to be his son by raising him from the dead. A pretty big exclamation point on how do we know he's really the right guy? How many other guys you know raised from the dead? How many other guys you know changed the whole calendar system of the entire world by this one fact, A, D, B, C, that we went over? Just Jesus. This is the punctuation point that he made, that exclamation point of, this is my son. I raised him from the dead. And it says, and amongst whom, verse 6 says, Paul says, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Now, he just said he was called of Jesus, right, to be an apostle. But he tells the people he's writing to, which if I read you just the next verse, you'll see who it is. You, it's obvious, but it, it says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as, as what? Saints. You're called to be saints. Now, if you, has anyone else besides me raised Roman Catholic? When we went to the church, we were taught the saints were the guys in stained glass. I mean, you know, and they were dead. And they did miracles, and they did, you know, they had all this stuff, bunch of requirements to be a saint, and it's not the word what is in here in the Bible. This word in Greek means believer. Anyone who believes in Jesus is a saint by pure definition of the word. The Catholic Church made it into a, a title, saint, with all these extra trimmings, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. He's saying, God has called me to be an apostle, and he's called you guys, it, all of you, to be called of his son, Jesus, to be his believers. You are saints because you believe in him. Who, who believes in Jesus? Raise your hand. All you guys raise your hand, you're all saints. In the eyes of the Lord, you are a saint. You're a believer in Jesus. Now to the believers in, so now we know who he's writing to. He's writing to believers. It, that, by the way, do we write differently if we're writing to our audiences? Say I'm talking to my believing friends or I'm talking to someone who doesn't know about the Lord. Would I write different points according to what the audience? Sure. So this book is really a book written to believers, to saints. It, to, to the non-believers, they're going to look at it and go, this is pretty deep. You know, I don't know, man. It's pretty deep. To the believers, they're going, this is good. Man, it covers all the main stuff I need. You know, this is like, like the real important stuff. This is a great book. Okay, yeah, because you have to know who it's written to. If I was trying to write to, well, maybe I have a, 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 a non-Christian friend that I want to introduce them to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Should I start them off in Romans? No, I don't recommend it. You know what I'd say I do? I would get them to read the gospel of John. Because in the Gospel of John, John says in chapter 20, he, said he, he says, I wrote these things. He gives the reason why he wrote too, by the way. So that you might believe in Jesus. And, and by believing in him, you might gain what? This one big deal. Everlasting, what was it? Life. He was like, I wrote so you could, basically, if you didn't know this, you could find out about Jesus and come to have everlasting life. So if you have a friend that doesn't know the Lord, 
Have them read the Gospel of John. But if they know the Lord and they want to get closer to the Lord, they want to get past some of the things they're struggling with. Maybe, you know, a lot of Christians, they come to faith and yet they still have things from their past that kind of are like, like bonds or like fetters, you know, they're, they're, they're shackles holding them back. They can't, they're like, Pastor, I want to serve the Lord, but I, I got stuff that keeps dragging me back. And the book of Romans can help them in such great ways to be freed. Because of this, Paul's writing to the believers some things they need to know. And he's been around a while. He's, he knows what he's, you know, I- this is not new stuff to him. He's writing this around 58 A.D., so the gospel's been going a while. Remember in 33 A.D. is when they crucified our Lord and he rose from the dead. And so Paul was Saul back then and he was persecuting the Christians and he, he even stood by while they were stoning one of the first martyrs in the church, Stephen, holding the robes of the guys that did it, going, yeah, all right, get that guy. That's how, he was very zealous, but for the wrong, the wrong thing. And the Lord was going to change him and convert him. And we saw that conversion. And now he says, God called me to do something different. So this is what he writes to them. Let's just do the first paragraph, what he writes to them. He says, first of all, I thank my God. He says, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to read the last part of verse 7. All you guys who are called of saints, here's his greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that a good greeting? You know, grace and peace from God. Anyone here need grace and peace? It's like every day. That's like, Lord, more grace. More of your peace. Your peace is really sweet. You know, the peace of the Lord, it says it's beyond all human comprehension. You know, we can be in a really bad situation but the Lord just gives us this calmness. And people are like, how can you stay so calm? And you're like, uh, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. When you're a believer, the Lord reassures you. He's with you, and it, it gives you a peace inside. So this is Paul. Hey, grace and peace to all you believers. And now he says this. He says, first of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Because he says your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. The the faith of these believers in Rome, word had spread. These guys were following Jesus in some manner that, that, I mean, now Rome was a very, what we would call at that time, they they were the world ruling power. People were coming and going through Rome. It was a hub of, of all commerce, of all, you know, political power. It was, and yet, as people are coming in and going out from this place, Paul says, word of your faith has spread. That you guys have faith. And he says, I thank God for your faith. Now, just so you know, Paul's writing from the, this place called Corinth. He's not at Rome. He's hearing about their faith. He's on his third missionary journey. And he has... Uh, when we get to chapter 15, I'll show you. He's just taken up a collection for the poor saints that are in Jerusalem. He's heard of the great persecution that's come to them. And so he's going to the Gentile churches and saying, guys, we got to help. You know, salvation was first to the Jews, not us. So we should help our, our brethren back in Jerusalem. And he took up offerings, not for himself. Paul never took up offerings we're aware of for himself. He had gifts sent to him. He said, thank you, but I don't seek the gift. I seek the the profit that you'll receive, he understood whenever you give to someone in the name of the Lord, Jesus said, if you do this to the least of my brethren, it's like you did it to who? To me. Now, if you do anything to the Lord, the Bible teaches us that God will be no man's debtor. You do something in in love to your fellow man and, and God goes, I see that. I got you. It's like you did it to me, he says. And if you do it to him, you can't outgive God. You do it to him, he goes, I got you, let me get, I'll, I'll repay you for that. Hey, try this sometime. Try to bless somebody and see if God doesn't bless you. Does this, do, has anyone experienced this where you bless somebody and the Lord, before you can even get home, blesses you back? You're like, wow, this is amazing. You know, every time we share the blessings of the Lord with others, he just blesses us back. And it's because 
I think he's just checking our heart to see how we are. You know, he's, he's trying to help us become more like him, compassionate and full of mercy. And so Paul says, I've heard about your guys' faith. Now, wouldn't that be a nice thing to be said? He's over in Corinth, and he's saying, I've heard of your guys' faith all the way from here. As I've been traveling on my missionary journey, I've heard the faith of this church in Rome is just off the hook. I mean, these guys are into the Lord. Now, I wouldn't mind if they said that about us. They heard about this little church on a beach in Hawaii that's just full of God's love and, and grace and mercy, and it's just, man, rocking it. And, and, and somebody says, I heard about that, and I'm all the way on the mainland, you know? That's what it'd be like. Well, it's, it's a little closer. We're, we're more remote, okay? But, but I'm just saying, it's a distance. It, it's just cool that the word had traveled that far. Wouldn't it be nice to have someone say that about your faith? They heard about your faith from far away, and they're like, I can't wait. Now, oh, by the way, here comes the part what his motivation. What's he, what's he after when he's writing to these guys? What does he want? I'm going to show you that today because he doesn't hide. He says, verse 9, For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness, as to how unceasingly I make mention of you in my prayers, always... He says, making request, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, he says, I might succeed in coming to you. He says, he, he wants to go see them. I mean, he's heard about their faith. He's like, I want to go check these guys out. I want to be with them. But here's why. He says it in the next verse. For I long to impart, what? Some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Now, if you don't know this about Paul the Apostle, he was used mightily. I mean, they were, we studied this with the kids uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago in the, in the youth night, that they were actually going to Paul in the book of Acts and stealing his handkerchiefs. In, in Greek, they're called sweat rags, you know, and they were taking his aprons. He was a tent maker, sewing tents, and, and I could just see him wiping down his face there in the Mediterranean where it's hot and muggy, just like you know, high humidity, and he's wiping his face. He sets his rag down. He goes back to sewing. He, he, he starts dripping some more, so he reaches for a rag. It's gone. Someone has nabbed his sweat rag, his, his handkerchief, and they've taken it. And do you know why they took it? You, you know why. What did they do? For the sick. They were like, this holy man has this anointing from God. He touched this. Like, his sweat is still on it. And they would take and run with it. And they'd get to the sick person and they would lay it on the sick person and say, holy man, touch this. See? Yeah, yeah that's him. <laughs> you can still smell him. And, and, and they would touch him. They would touch the sick person. What would happen to the sick person? they get healed. I mean, this guy couldn't hang on to handkerchiefs. They were just swiping them from him. And they were... The, yet he says, I can't wait to be with you so I could impart to you spiritual gifts. You know, there's, there's things that he knew that they needed still, and he knew why. He said it right there. I want to impart spiritual gifts to you. Pay attention to this. This is very important. So that you might be established. What does it mean when we say to be established? Made firm, like planted, you know, uh, or if a bu business, they say, established in, you know, 1941, this business when, you know, right? It was, it was brought into, into being in a way that it's stuck there. It's around. It's, it's an establishment. It's not something going anywhere. He says, I want your faith to get that foundation, that, that stability it needs, that thing that anchors it, that lets you have a spot to grow in. But if you don't have gifts from the Lord, and by the way, the, Paul will write a lot about these gifts when he writes to the, uh, some of his other epistles. He'll, he'll talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how, how they are to be exercised. They're gifts like, well, how about the gift of hospitality? Did you guys know that's a gift of the Holy Spirit? Some of you gals already have it. Some of you guys even have it. Just very hospitable. Some people don't even know that. Have, have any of you met some people that just have extraordinary amount of hospitality i mean you know that this is not this is not normal this they have 
a gift. There's other people who have the gift called the gift of helps. You know, when you're in trouble and you need help, how come there's cer only certain guys you call? I mean, some of them you call and you're like, they will be no help. <laughs> do not bother, you know, like, because they do not have the gift of helps. There are certain men I know don't waste my time calling when, when I need help with something. And yet there are other brothers that I know, if I need help, like Alfred, not to mention any names, <laughs> Alfred, if I need help, he's right there. And those guys are a joy. And that yet, you know what? God gave them the gift from his spirit called the gift of helps. And the Bible tells us whatever gift you've been given, you, maybe you're a gifted teacher. Maybe you're a, a gifted encourager. Did you know that's a gift? Of this? Some people can just, how many of you know somebody who when you go around, they just lift your spirit? They just encourage you. That's, that's a gift from the Holy Ghost God gave. Now, if you have the gift of encouragement, and I'm a good pastor, what would I try to get you to do with your gift? Use it. I don't care if it's a gift of helps, it's a gift of hospitality, it's a gift of encouragement, it's a gift of teaching, it's a gift of, of prophesying, whatever the gift may be that God gives you, the only benefit or time it benefits everyone else is if you use it. There is, there is something that is just really wrong about people that have gifts that don't use them. I mean, we even can spot that. When we see people that have gifts and they just... Sit on their thumbs. I ain't going to use that gift. Look, God gave you that gift. You, 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 you see, Dottie says he gave her the gift to talk. We know that, Dot. There's no doubt. But you know what she does? She uses that gift to call people when they're down, to check up on them for them. I, I can call Dot and say, Dot, I got a full schedule. Can you take, you know, take care of this for me? Call Steve. Call, call Cookie, see how they're doing, check up on this person. And I can tell her like five, ten people to check on, and she'll do it. Faithfully, check on each one. And that's a gift. Okay, and it, what, but whatever your gift is, Paul would be the kind of guy going, I can't wait to get there. Because some people don't even know they have gifts available. So he's going to teach them about the gifts, of course. And he's going to, like we saw in, in the book of Acts, when he would pray over somebody. They get healed, or he would pray over them and they would receive the gifts of the Spirit right then. He's like, I can't wait to get there. I'm going to see you guys. I, I've heard of your faith. You guys got faith. But he wants them not just to have faith. He wants them to have faith and be established. Okay, and that's different. He's not really what we call, what I call the heart of, um, like, like of an evangelist. Evangelists are guys who like to go and share the gospel and see people who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus. They're what I call the introductory guys, you know. Let me introduce you to Jesus. You need him, you know. And like Greg Glory, our dear brother that does the Harvest Crusades, he's a, he's a gifted teacher, but he's really an anointed evangelist. That man, his, if, if you ask him what's your real calling, he'd probably say, my pastor, but I know I'm really called to be an evangelist like like he has that heart like billy graham did you know just to talk to people if you don't know about jesus i want to introduce you and i remember when the lord called me here to hawaii just the month before he had called uh, uh, my wife and i to come here there was a man in our fellowship in in arizona named ron miller and he's in your bulletin by the way he's the one doing the orphanages over in thailand and he he said, I feel like I'm supposed to, he was in the Vietnam War. He always felt like somehow in his lifetime he was going to go back. He saw a lot of devastation and something that stirs something inside him. And when he gave his life to the Lord, he, he felt this pricking of God's spirit. You need to go but give back to that land what you saw raped, what you saw pillaged by the war. I want you to go and give the life of the Lord back to those people and so he came we laid hands on him pray for him sent him out a month later they laid hands on us and we got sent out here and he was our first missionary we ever supported because I mean you know I know him he's out there going to help the the Christian happy home 
um, with Rose Martinez. She, was, she had started years before, and he's going to go help. And so we're just like, great. You know, I, God, by the way, if you ever come alongside helping widows and orphans, you, you know in the Bible, right, God's always the champion for the widows and the orphans. So if you really want God's favor, get in line with him. You know, be in alignment with his heart and help the widows and the orphans. So I'm like, we got to help him. And he'd be preaching to the people, you need to know about Jesus so you can have everlasting life. And he has such a gift to do it, man. People were getting saved all the time. And after they got saved, he'd call me up and he'd say, Is, I love to see them come to know Jesus, but once they come to know Jesus, I don't know what to do with them. I don't have the patience that you do. This is what he used to tell me. I don't have the patience that you do. Like, you, you just sit there and wait for them to grow, and you, and you plant seeds, and you water seeds, and it's really a long time till you see the plant come up, and then it takes a long time till it makes a fruit, and then, it, you know, and he hated that. He had been too much Americanized, you know, instant gratification, order at the drive up speaker, drive forward, pick up the food, go. You know, he thought Christianity should be like that. Introduce them to Jesus at this window, drive up to the next window, they're fully mature. <laughs> Meal is served. Something. I go, it doesn't work like that. It takes, a, you know, <laughs> a little growth here. That's why they're called babes in Christ, right? You start off as a baby, and you know what happens when you have babies, right? They eat, they poop, you clean them, they repeat. <laughs> then they sleep. Then they eat, they poop, they sleep. They kind of vary between those three, but it's always those three. And, so, and cry a lot. And in between, there's a little bit of growth goes on. And sometimes not very fast. Sometimes it takes a long time until they, right? And you've got to be patient. Now, as parents, we're patient to watch our own children grow. But I've seen a lot of Christians be really impatient with other Christians. While God's trying to grow them. They don't even recognize or realize that that person is just a work in progress. And we're all at different places. We've all, some of you have been growing at the Lord a long time. How many of you have been in Christ over 10 years? Raise your hand. Look around. This is, we got 20 years. Keep them up. 20, 30, 40. Oh my gosh. We, just tells me we got some people way long into this. And some Anyone here less than a year in Jesus? Raise your hand. He's just new to the faith. Raise your, we got right there, Phaedra. We got some. See, we're all at different places. And that's okay. What Ron didn't like was, I don't, I don't like waiting for him to grow. He's like, Is, what do you do? I'm like, you feed him. You burp him. You clean the diapers. You repeat. You know, and he was like, what? I don't have to patient. I said, Ron, you are called to be an evangelist. The pastor-teacher thing doesn't really suit you too well. <laughs> you know, he could teach too. But pastoring requires patience while well, you look after the flock and wait for it to grow. It takes a, it's a different calling. Now, Paul says he was an apostle called to bring about obedience to faith. He's kind of a, well, who seems to be really anointed to introduce people to Jesus. He's almost like Ron was. Get them saved. Okay? But he's going to get stretched. And he's going to wind up actually staying in Ephesus for a couple years and, and planting churches and, and pastoring, which I'm sure he grew a bit from doing because you can't help it. When you, you know, whenever God puts you over a group of people to help lead them, guess who he expects to grow first? You. If you think you get to be up front and you don't get to grow first, you're wrong. Because he never calls his leaders to say, do as I say, not as I do. He expects the leaders to lead by example. Jesus said, I am the master. You call me Lord, right? Now, what did he do at the Last Supper? He laid aside his outer garment. He had just the, what we call the undergarment. He took a a bowl, a basin of water, and a towel. And what did he begin to do? He washed their feet. Now, he says, I'm the Lord. I'm the master, right? I'm the big kahuna. 
and I washed your feet. And washing the feet, by the way, was the lowest of the low servant's job. He says, if I'm the master and I washed your feet, what should you do for one another? See, he's saying, I serve. I might have the power, the authority, the title of the ruler, the Lord, the master, but you don't use that title to make people serve you. You use that power to serve others. That's what a true servant does. And that's what Jesus came to be. He said, I did not come to, for, for you guys. to." He said, I came to serve you. He didn't come to make us serve him. He came to serve us and show us the example. And so here, Paul says, I can't wait. I got to be with you guys so I can see you established. You got faith. Now you need the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit because they help you lock in and grow. You find out what gift. Is, and by the way, God has differing gifts for each of you. He knows what gift will suit you. Your personality, he knows how he wants to use you. And one of the sweetest things is when you, when you let him impart those gifts to you and you start getting used, who feels good at the end of the day? You know, when you, would anybody here be willing to get a gift of, of praying for the sick? Like, I mean, like serious miracle kind of power praying. Like somebody's leg is like, like, lame they can't even walk and you get to lay hands on them and the muscles grow right on the bone right in front of you would anyone do that with me if there was someone really needed a touch would you be willing to or their bone is snapped out of place would you be willing to pray and go, let god put it just just you know who, who thinks that would be fun okay because you know first of all i have found that he, he kind of seems to give that gift to the adventuresome because this is a pretty big adventure when you get used to pray for somebody and their stuff not attached and it's all messed up and you pray and all of a sudden God goes and puts it back together under your fa right under your fingertips and you're like, whew. I mean, the first time it happened to me, I was like, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> it freaked me out. I was like, God, sorry about complaining. I'll, I'll keep leading people to Christ and teaching them. Then you get some other guys to do that. That was just, it was cool, but it was freaky. You know, and some people don't think about this. They don't think about that part. You know, when it actually happens, when the miracle happens, and you're the one praying. But had Paul seen any miracles like this? Did they ever happen to him that he saw them and he, he sure. They were stealing his sweat rags just to, just to, you know, like, we can't get him over, just get his hanky. Snab it. Paul says, I want to come see you. Now listen to this. Verse 12, he says, here's something that he recognized that I want you to recognize. He can't wait to go be with them and see them established, impart to them a spiritual gift. He says, that is, that I may encourage, be encouraged, he says, together with you while I'm among you. Each of us, he says, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. An interesting I, I call this a very mature insight. Whenever you go to encourage someone else, this is something you need to recognize. It is impossible for you to go encourage someone else. Tori goes and visits Stephen Cookie to encourage them. Will just Stephen Cookie get encouraged? No. Because whenever you're used by God to bring encouragement to someone else, as that encouragement flows through you, guess who gets encouraged? In the process, you do. It is impossible for you to bring encouragement to someone else without God bringing encouragement to your heart in the doing. You don't think so? It's you haven't tried. You tried this week. Trying to be someone who encourages someone else. And by the way, this is going to sound really counterintuitive. Say you're having a really, really down day yourself. You're like at low lows. And, I don't want to show hands, but anyone ever here felt low besides me? Guess what you should do when you feel low? You go find someone else who feels lower or, you know, equal, whatever, just low. And you encourage them. And you know what will happen to you? You'll be lifted. When you, and Paul knew this, he says, I, now put yourself here in this 
setting. You're in Corinth, you're on a missionary journey, you're hearing about their faith, and you can't wait to see them so that they can be established in their faith with spiritual gifts. But he says also that I could be encouraged together with you. He, he, he understood it was impossible to get together with other believers to try to encourage them without it coming back and encourage, right? He's like, both of us, both your faith and mine, we're going to both be encouraged because we get together. And by the way, the Bible tells us in the last days men will forsake the assembling together of themselves. When it comes to going to church, they'll say, oh, I don't need anyone else. I, I can do this on my own. You know, have you run into those lone Christians? By the way, very dangerous attitude to have. Satan wants you to be alone. He wants you to get away from the flock of God because then it's just like a sheep out to the, out, you know, off away from the rest of the flock. He goes, ah, a wandering one. You know, the Bible says that the devil, he, 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 he's roaming about like a what? A roaring lion seeking whom he might what? Devour. Devour. Do you think a roaring lion goes after the whole flock? No, you know what they do, right? They, they separate one of the weak ones away. And when they get that weak one away, what are they, that's, when the, that's when they pounce. That's when they take, and that's what the devil wants to do. And so a lot of believers today are missing out on a very important part of what they need, even though they don't understand it. They're discouraged. And they're like, I'm discouraged. I'm not going to go to church. And I've said this before. On the day when you feel the least like going to church, what should you do that day? Go to church. That's the day you need it the most. That's the day, if you can receive it in your spirit, your, your, your spirit, by the way, will bear witness that this is true. That's the day when you really need to be at church. Because that's the day when inside you're struggling and, and, and you, might not, you might not even get this. You might be thinking, well, I need someone to speak to me and encourage me because I'm really down. And you know what God's going to do? Not what you're thinking. He's going to send you to church, sit you next to someone else who's way downer than you, and say, Jan, I want you to encourage him. Or her. And you'd be like, but I'm already down. Just do it. Right? And then, I, okay, I got my wife, Jan, and I got Artie's wife, Jan, right there. Sorry, either one of you Jans will work. But... <laughs> Okay, you Jan, encourage that Jan, okay? I mean, it doesn't matter. If, if one goes, you go on that day when you don't feel like going, and you're thinking, well, maybe God will have someone speak to me encouraging words. You might find out you're being sent to be the one to give encouraging words. And if you can receive this, it's impossible to give encouraging words without God's Spirit flowing as it flows through you. Those words of encouragement are life to someone else who's down. And those words will flow through your lips. And as they fall from your lips, God will strengthen your heart. The Bible says, out of a man's mouth, he speaks what is in his what? In his heart. God will look and he will take your heart. And you know, you could be down. And he might be sending you because maybe you just need to see you don't have it so bad. You know, someone came a couple weeks ago. They were down. They were struggling. They got here. They saw the feeding that was going on. We feed the homeless before the service. They were here just a couple minutes early. They saw the breakfast. They saw someone who had no shoes, no shirt. The fellow just looked, you know, like he had been beat up. And as she listened, she said, I overheard that he was beat up. Those marks on his face and stuff, the bruises, that's because someone jumped him and took all his stuff. And... She was saying, I felt pretty bad, like my life was bad. I have a car, I had a clean shower, I got clean clothes. You know, I, wah, 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 I'm having a bad day. But she went to church and realized, I have a really good day compared to what, you know, sometimes we just need a little adjustment of our attitude. And the Lord has wired us where we don't always adjust well on our own. We need a little help from one another. So he puts us with others 
that can just just rub off on us. Just sometimes just being next to them, we're like, man, I feel better. You know, some of you are hug deprived. I could tell this morning in the Aloha time. You just needed a hug. Fix, you know, it's so funny. Because in Hawaii, you know, uh, that's just a normal greeting to give the hug and the kiss, you know, when you greet someone. The mainlanders are like, stiff. They're going to hug me. I don't know what to do. You know. <laughs> and then afterwards, they, they write little things and put them in our tie box that says, I really liked your church. It's so full of love. We don't have that. Could you pray we have that in our church? They're from somewhere in the mainland, you know, usually back east. I'm like, it's going to take some work. But the good Lord is the Lord that loves us. And it, and it says we know how to love because he first loved us. And Paul knew this love. And Paul was like, I can't wait to be together with you guys. Man, it's going to be great. I'm going to get encouraged. You're going to get encouraged. We're, we're both all going to be encouraged by one another. And this is what happens. Now he says in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often have planned to come to you. And I've been prevented, he says so far, he says that I might obtain some fruit from you as I have also amongst the rest of the Gentiles. He says, for I'm under obligation to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so that for my part, he says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. He's not hiding why, he, why he's coming. He says, I'm going to come. I'm going to receive some fruit from you. I'm going to impart some gifts to you. I'm going to preach the good news to you. He said, this is, I, I am under obligation, he says. Now, who's he obliged to? Who, who made him under obligation to preach? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus told him. You're going to be my vessel. I'm sending. He, that's why we went over how he said he was called an apostle by the will of who? Of God. He said, God called me to do it. I'm pretty sure Paul would have picked this job on his own. You know, you look at all the beatings he's going to go through, all the stuff. It was not his first pick, but it was God's pick for him. And he was willing to say, this is what God called me to do. This is, I can't wait to come see you. And, and you guys, you have a calling. You're called to be his saints. You are his believers. I can't wait to get together. I'm going to be encouraged. You're going to be encouraged. We can encourage one another. And I have, to, I have to do this. You get to find out his motives. He said he was under obligation to do this. To preach both to Greeks and to barbarians in, in Greek culture. <laughs> if you didn't speak Greek, you know how in English we say, it's all Greek to me? <laughs> well, if you're a Greek and you don't speak Greek, because Greek has its own nice flow to it, the sound of other languages to someone who's fluent in Greek, they say it's um, bar, 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 you know. So, when, <laughs> you guys are laughing because <laughs> English people say this about other people's languages. They say that about us. Anyone that couldn't speak Greek, a Greek person would go, bar, 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 barbarian. That's where we get the word barbarian. Bar, bar. That's the sound that the Greeks perceive it of your language because you don't have that fluent, flowing Greek tongue. So I'm under obligation. To the Greeks, to the bar, bar, the ones that don't speak Greek, to the ones that are wise, and to the ones that are foolish. Nobody's excluded. I'm under obligation to preach the gospel to them. That's why he's doing this. Now, next week, the, well, I'm saving verse 16. It's a whole sermon, okay? I refuse to do it today. Because it just, it's got it, it's powerful. And it introduces us to the tone of the rest of this book. Where he's going to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto what? You guys know this, right? Verse 6, unto salvation. To the Jew first, and then to who? Come on. The us. The Gentiles, okay? So this book's written to us. Would you do me a favor? Read ahead. 
and just oops, see, seek the Lord to see these, uh, these sweet part of this upcoming part of this chapter. It's, it's going to take me a little while to break down, but it is worth it. This chapter, by the time we're done with it, you will just be going, man, I just feel a lot better about my faith. You know, your faith will be established. You, and we're only going to be in the first chapter. Just watch how he's going to just lay down a f solid foundation to build on for your faith to grow. And if you've never really experienced what I call a real spurt of spiritual growth, where you really had that, you know sometimes how kids go through growth spurts and they grow real fast? I notice Christians that study the book of Romans in depth. Well, it's like miracle growth for, for Christians, you know? Sprinkle Romans on them and all of a sudden it's like spiritual. They, they're going through growth spurts. I mean, they just sprout up in their faith. They grow so fast. It's a marvelous thing. It, it just makes me like, now see, I'm a pastor. I want to see you guys grow. And I know it takes time, and I'm patient, but I'm also like a smart farmer. You know, the smart farmer knows what fertilizers to put on the plant at what time, when to put the water, when to, you know, when to take the seed and move it from the greenhouse to the ground, when to, you know, thin down the plants around to make room for more growth. All that stuff to promote growth. I want to see you guys all grow in your, in your faith in the Lord and be, like Paul said, established. So we got a great book to study as we continue this book. I pray it'll just speak to your heart these little, these little things as we go along and you're just going to be going, ooh, another nugget. Let me put that in my chest. There's another spiritual nugget to put that. You're going to be so spiritually rich, you're going to be going, oh, look at this treasure chest I got. We studied Romans really in depth. And you'll see that there are such sweet things for your faith in this book. You'll be walking away going, man, that I needed that to grow. I need it. There's going to be some things that are going to challenge you in your growth. And don't worry, that's okay. Sometimes we need a little challenge to do it. How many of you know what gift God has given you by His Spirit already? You, you, you know you have a gift. Some of you have a gift already. Okay? What would I tell you to do with your gift this week? Use it. Do me a favor. This week, all of you that have already received a gift that you know what it is, please use it for the glory of the Lord. And those of you that don't know what gifts you have or, or, or you want a gift, who wants a gift that doesn't know what gifts there are? If you want one, Listen, it's going to be really exciting to share with you this upcoming studies in Romans because I will go in depth about the different gifts available. And I guarantee there'll be one that suits you. You'll be like, that one. I want that one. Okay? And what do we have to do to get a gift from God? We ask Him, right? Ask and you shall what? What does He say? Receive. So I look forward to seeing how He's going to impart gifts and grow this, this group and, and also the others that will hear us later through the internet and the radio, that they too get to grow just from hearing these things. So would you join me? Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for a man that would write so, well, with no, mo no, no none of that wishy-washy stuff. He, he says what he means and why he's doing it. And Lord, for that, I'm really grateful that you sent a man like, like Saul to become Paul and to use him for your kingdom. Lord, use each of us for your kingdom. As we go from here this, this day, Lord, we just pray you would be glorified in our lives, that your gifts, the gifts of your spirit would be poured out, Lord, to everyone here. Whatever gift you, you deem, Lord, would suit us best, we want those gifts to be given, Lord, freely in our midst, that they would be poured out and people would discover their gifts and they would, and they would learn to use them for your glory. And I ask that as we go from here, in Jesus' name, and everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll close with a closing song. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.